This is a video on hypercholesterolemia. I'll be talking about an overview of this topic as well as the pathophysiology of hypercholesterolemia. I'll also be talking about the cause and presentation in the clinic, the definition and how to diagnose hypercholesterolemia, as well as some treatment and drugs, mainly statins and who needs a statin, as well as some alternatives to statins. First, let's look at how hypercholesterolemia fits in with hyperlipidemia and dyslipidemia. So hypercholesterolemia is defined as high cholesterolemia in the blood. This is a subset of hyperlipidemia or high lipids in the blood. Lipids are a broader category and cholesterols are a subset of lipids. And hyperlipidemia is a subset of dyslipidemia or dysregulation of lipids in the blood. So that's how they fit into each other. And the main reason we wanna talk about this topic is because cholesterol can form plaques inside of arteries as shown in this image here. This can cause all kinds of complications down the road, like myocardial infarctions, like strokes, like renal artery stenosis, mesenteric ischemia, and many others. Anywhere you have arteries, those arteries can get clogged with atherosclerosis, and oftentimes one of the main risk factors is hypercholesterolemia, so that's why we're interested in this. Let's start with an overview, the pathophysiology of hypercholesterolemia. There's pretty complicated biochemistry um, of what's going on here. There are metabolic pathways that you can look up. In general, there's this exogenous pathways of stuff getting absorbed from the gut, um, cholesterol making its way over to the liver where it's synthesized and then distributed out to the periphery in the endogenous pathway, and then stuff is returned from the periphery back to the liver um, in the reverse transport pathway. All of that's pretty complicated. I've kind of summarized it here with a few key points. In general, cholesterol is transported in the blood. I'm going to be talking about a simplified model where we categorize the proteins, the lipoproteins, according to the density. So there are highly dense lipoproteins or high density lipoproteins. That's HDL, commonly called the good cholesterol. This is the reverse transport pathway. The good cholesterol is good because it clears cholesterol plaques from peripheral blood vessels. It returns the cholesterol to the liver, so this has a protective effect for atherosclerosis. It reduces atherosclerosis. In the other pathway, the endogenous pathway, LDL and others, so that's like intermediate density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, these are considered the bad cholesterol because they distribute cholesterol to the periphery where it can block the arterial lumen like we saw in the previous slide. And as I mentioned, this can lead to myocardial infarctions, strokes, CVAs, carotid stenosis, peripheral vascular disease, renal artery stenosis, and other problems with arteries throughout the body. So although this is pretty complicated, you can kind of remember it as the simplified model. There's good cholesterol and there's bad cholesterol. So we essentially want pretty high HDL and pretty low LDL and IDL. What are some causes for hypercholesterolemia? First, there are some non-modifiable risk factors. In general, your uh, risk of having poor cholesterol, so that's a low HDL and a high LDL, increases with age. And in general, men have worse hypercholesterolemia. There are also environmental risk factors. This includes diet, weight, stress, and, and generally an inactive lifestyle. There are several associated conditions. Um, I'm listing them here. I'm also listing how to find them. These aren't necessarily causatory for hypercholesterolemia, but they're associated. So uh, type two diabetes, for instance, which is screened with a blood glucose or hemoglobin A1C is associated with hypercholesterolemia. It's not entirely clear if type two diabetes causes hypercholesterolemia or if, for instance, a poor diet, stress, and an inactive lifestyle can cause both type two diabetes and uh, bad lipid control. Obesity is associated, that's screened with a BMI. Alcoholism or uh, chronic alcohol uh, abuse can be screened with a CAGE screen. And the hypothyroidism, which can be um, noticed on T TSH blood test. Cushing syndrome, which you can find with cortisol in the serum. Liver disease, uh, which you see with LFTs. Renal disease, which you see with creatinine. Uh, the BUN and the urine protein and pregnancy are all associated with hypercholesterolemia. Some medications are known to dysregulate cholesterol in the blood, so that's estrogen, glucocorticoids, and other steroids in general, as well as some diuretics like thiazide diuretics can increase your LDL. 
There's also primary disorders of cholesterol, um, specifically the familial dyslipidemia syndromes. There's um, at least five types of this and some subtypes within this. These are important to recognize and to know that there are genetic factors that can cause cholesterol problems, but the vast majority of high, of high cholesterol that you'll see is probably secondary hypercholesterolemia, uh, usually secondary to environmental risk factors like weight, diet, stress, and inactivity. In general, we want to screen um, with a lipid panel in all males who are over 35 years old, all women who are over 45 years old, or any patient who has any kind of coronary vascular disease that is over 20 years old. So uh, most older adults and some younger adults with coronary vascular disease. We typically diagnose hypercholesterolemia with uh, the screens. So we screen these people, and if they have problems on a lipid panel, we'll diagnose them from that. There are also examination findings, and these are sometimes present usually with people with the genetic um, dyslipidemia syndrome. So um, these are the exam findings. There are xanthelesmas, or yellow plaques on the eyelids, like you can see here. There's also xanthomas. There are several subtypes of xanthomas. The one shown here is xanthoma tuberosum, which is a solid yellow mass on the tendons. You can see on this person's knee here. And again, these are typically only seen in the genetic syndromes, the familial dyslipidemia syndromes. On this slide, we'll show how to define and diagnose hypercholesterolemia. Now there are these blood tests, and on the blood tests, you can find the total cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, and the HDL cholesterol. Again, remember the LDL cholesterol is the bad one, and the HDL cholesterol is the good one. So in general, you want to have a low LDL, so it's most desirable to have it as low as possible, and it's more desirable to have a higher HDL. So HDL above 60 and an LDL below 100 um, are, are desirable. And this says most desirable, I guess it's even more desirable to have an LDL below 70 because there is some evidence that an LDL below 70 can reduce atherosclerosis, can actually reverse the clot formation if you have a very, very low LDL. And again, it's also to remember that these aren't very um, strong, like hard and set numbers. They're, this is from one source that I found from the National Heart um, Institute. Uh, there are other numbers reported from other labs, and this is just kind of a, just a guideline. In fact, these numbers might not matter as much as these, um, deciding who gets a statin. Now, statins are the main drugs used to treat hypercholesterolemia. Their mechanism is that they inhibit HMG-CoA reductase, and they are essentially used in many patients to prevent atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So a patient with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease will need to be on a statin for sure. A patient with an LDL that is very high, above 190, automatically gets a statin. A patient with an LDL that is even moderately high, uh, with a risk score of at least 7.5, should get a statin as well. Now this risk score, you can find calculators online to find your atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk score. It takes the patient's age, the patient's race, the patient's history of diabetes, hypertension, um, their current blood pressure, uh, whether or not they're on blood pressure meds, as well as their total cholesterol and their HDL levels. And I think uh, one of the major associations recommends treating anybody that has a um, moderately high LDL and a risk score of 7.5% with a statin. This risk, this risk score means that a patient has, in the next 10 years, this percent chance of having a um, coronary heart attack or a coronary uh, vascular event, so angina, unstable angina, or a heart attack. Some physicians think that this is too strict. Um, this has way too many people on statins, and they might opt for a 10% threshold instead, but um, this is the recommendation, 7.5%. Lastly, you want to give a statin to people with an LDL above 70, um, if that person is also old, so maybe above 65, 75, if that person is a diabetic, or if that person is hypertensive, or a smoker. So essentially, the same thing that we had above. If you have risk factors for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and if you have even a moderately high LDL um, you should be on a statin. So in general, uh, almost everybody gets a statin who isn't perfectly healthy. If you have any um, chronic disease, diabetes, or smoking, or uh, hypertension, or you're overweight, you're obese, you will probably end up being on a statin. 
Lastly, let's talk about the treatment and the drugs. So I've mentioned these statins quite a bit. These are these examples of statins. So they're kind of in categories of high intensity, moderate intensity, and low intensity. High intensity statins, you can expect them to decrease your LDL by about 50%, maybe more. Moderate intensity statins can decrease LDL by 30 to 50%, and low intensity can decrease LDL by usually less than uh, 30%. So the high intensity statins are atorvastatin and rosuvastatin in the doses listed here. So 40 or 80 milligrams of atorvastatin, 20 or 40 milligrams of rosuvastatin. The moderate intensity statins are uh, also atorvastatin and rosuvastatin at lower doses than the ones shown above, but also lovastatin, pravastatin, and simvastatin. And if you even decrease the doses of lovastatin, pravastatin, and simvastatin, you get a low intensity statin. Now before starting somebody on a statin, you want to take baseline levels, so some baseline blood tests, just so that you could have them in case you need to monitor these numbers going up and down over the course of them being on the statin. So you'll take baseline lipid panel, um, which is usually what led you to screen these people for hypercholesterolemia and usually what put them on um, the statin to begin with. You'll also want liver function tests. Um, these drugs can be toxic to the liver. It's pretty uncommon, but you would want this just in case. Creatinine kinase, in case these patients have myopathies, uh, you can kind of track the progression of that with creatinine kinase. And the statins have also been known to increase your A1C moderately and sometimes transiently. So it'd be good to get a baseline A1C. Now this DM every three months, that's probably overkill. You can probably check uh, for diabetes every maybe six months, every year after starting a statin. Um, but typically you want to monitor lipids annually as well. Um, see how much the statin is working, what other lifestyle changes um, that patient might need to make, and if that patient might need a second agent as well. So again, you want to start, you want to check for uh, LFTs upon starting. You want to be on the lookout for hepatitis when starting. Sometimes you'll see symptoms of hepatitis. That'd be red upper quadrant pain or jaundice. Um, that would prompt you to do more liver function tests. If a patient has muscle symptoms, including sore or weak muscles, you can repeat a creatinine kinase and see if that has changed from your baseline value. If the patient does have a myositis or a hepatitis after starting a statin, you sometimes want to do a washout period of that statin and then try them on a lower dose. So if, for instance, you started them on a torvastatin 80 milligram and they have uh, myopathy and they have an elevated creatinine kinase, you wash out from the statin, wait a few weeks, and then maybe restart them on a lovastatin of 40 milligrams, so a weaker intensity statin. So this is important because you don't want to give up on statins, you want to start them as a lower dose. That's how useful these drugs are. Um, even if they have side effects, um, wash it out, give them some time, and then start them on a lower intensity statin. If they really can't handle a lower intensity statin, there are other drugs you can try, but none of these have as good of an effect um, or as good of a mortality reduction for cardiac uh, atherosclerotic heart disease as the statins. So really you want to try lower doses of statins before moving on to these, um, but if they really cannot tolerate statins, these are some of your other options. The first category is fibrates. This includes uh, phenofibrate and gemfibrozil. These are second line to statins. The mechanism of action for these is that they increase lipoprotein reductase, which results in a decrease in the triglycerides and an increase in HDL. The main side effect here is similar to statins, that's myositis, so you definitely don't want to combine the fibrates with the statins. Another category is ezetimibe. Mechanism of action for ezetimibe is that it decreases cholesterol absorption, which decreases LDL in the blood. If you decrease cholesterol absorption in the gut, you can imagine that you'll have cholesterol kind of making its way to the colon and then out um, into the stool, and that can cause diarrhea and flatus and kind of steatorrhea, greasy stool picture, so that's pretty unpleasant. Third category is bile acid sequestrants. This includes cholestyramine, cholestopol, and cholecevalin. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that last one right. The mechanism here is that these drugs are a resin that bind lipids. They sequester the lipids from the enterohepatic circulation, and the body then produces and dumps more bile acid into the GI tract. So these prevent lipids um, from entering hepato, uh, enterohepatic circulation, forcing the body to make more bile acids. And in the process of making more bile acids, the body has to use up LDL. So the, the effect here is that it reduces LDL in the blood. Similar to the ezetimibe, the side effect here is diarrhea, flatus, 
uh, greasy stools. Lastly, last category is niacin. The mechanism of niacin is that it decreases free fatty acid release from the body fat. In this case, the liver cannot make lipoproteins and LDL synthesis is reduced. So this reduces LDL um, in the blood by stopping the body from releasing free fatty acids from the body fat. Side effect here is pruritus, so it can give you kind of a systemic itchiness. It can also increase your blood glucose, increase your uric acid, and it can cause flushing of the skin. An important association to know is that if you have niacin-induced flushing of the skin, you can treat that with aspirin. Um, that would, that's kind of the antidote to niacin-induced flushing of the skin. This has been a video on hypercholesterolemia, including the pathophysiology, the cause, the presentation, the diagnosis, as well as treatment, drugs, and mostly statin. Uh, if this discussion was helpful, uh, thank you for listening, um, and uh, hope you join us for other videos.